I'm Mel Stewart, and this is Swim Swam Podcast. Joining me today is a very special guest, somebody I've wanted to have on for a very long time, 16 major international medals, one, of course, an Olympic champion, winning that gold medal in perhaps one of the most exciting races I have ever seen in my life. It is a piece of history that you need to go back and revisit. Today, we have Tyler Clary. Hey, hey, thanks for having me on, Mel. Quite the intro, by the way. <laughs> well, here's the thing. It's a, um, you know, I was on deck before Swim Sam existed. I was on deck with this little company called Swim Network, which was USA Swimming's version of a news website. So I was on deck a lot. So I was there when you were still Scott Flowers. When, yep. um, and we'll get into, you know, your name change and, and the narrative behind that. But I was there and I felt like I watched you from, you know, your the very genesis of who you are. And so when I got to 2012 and I was, and I witnessed the Olympics, uh, your 200 backstroke, it, it is, it's one of the greatest performances in history for one reason. It's that final 50 in the 200 backstroke and let's set it up. It's, it's lofty every year. You're, you're not even, not, folks don't, don't, don't think this is your race. Their, their eyes are all focused on him. You rode him for 150 meters. You came home in a 40 and a 28 well, on the final 50. 2848. So, whoa, what was going on in that race? Talk me through it. Well, I, I guess to start out, I mean, you know, you, you expressed the sentiment just a minute ago that, that I even shared, like my, my eyes were on Ryan because that was, you know, that was supposed to be his, his meat. Right. And, and in many ways it still was, but um, you know, I had to kind of spoil that a little bit, but it was, I remember that that was one of the first times that I had actually visualized before a race. Like I wasn't, I'm not, I wouldn't characterize myself as one who actively visualized before most of my races. I was just kind of an instinctual racer and, and maybe that helped me, maybe that hurt me, but that's just kind of how I did things. And I remember leading up to that race, I, I imagined every possible permutation limited only by my own imagination of how that race could go, right? Like, like what, what would I do, feel, think, how would I respond if I was first at the 50, which would like never happen, but <laughs> that's, you know, those were some of the things that I thought about. What would happen if my goggles broke? What would happen if, you know, the butt of my suit ripped open? Like, what would I, what would I do in all those situations to kind of sort of kind of control what I, what I could control? And I remember thinking to myself going into that, 150 wall knowing that I had actually pulled over on the lane line to to draft on Ryan for at least the second half of the third lap thinking like you know I'm I'm I knew I was in striking distance to be on on the podium I didn't necessarily think that I was in striking distance to win the thing but I do remember um, coming up off that last wall probably having the best underwater dolphin kick um, string of my life and I could see splashing off to my right side. Um, I couldn't see exactly what it was, but I knew that there was, you know, I was close to some people and body started shutting down. I just remember saying to myself, uh, you know, put your hands as far as you, you can above your head, grab as much water, throw it at your feet and let's see who's got the biggest pair of cojones coming home. And whether that's by stupidity or by being able to resist pain, um, it ended up working out. But I, I remember hitting the wall and looking back and honestly expecting to see second or third place. And I would have been absolutely elated, but you know, seeing the number one and then also the Olympic record um, was beyond imagination in my opinion at that point. Olympic record by half a second. Yeah. So not much, but a record. Oh, no, no, that's, that's <laughs> huge. It's huge. That's, that is, that is a, you, you shaved a lot. We can't, it, it's um, no, it was an extraordinary swim, but what's, I mean, how often do people go, this was your first Olympics. Uh, you know, we, we'll we get into the third places in a minute, but it, it, I would say that if just at the outset, if, if you if anybody who doesn't know Tyler Clary's career what needs to know that he was a workhorse and he was also competing in swimming at perhaps one of the most competitive 
eras in swimming history. Uh, and we, we could talk a little bit about Michael and Phelps and we can talk about Ryan Lochte, but so you had a lot of international experience coming in, but this was your first Olympics yeah. and you're just to unpack this. You're like, I just want to get on the podium. And how, how do you, how does that 28 four final 50 compared to your other final fifties over the previous four years? That, uh, it's a great question. And you're, you're probably in a better position to answer that than I am. But I, I do know that it was probably one of the best, if not the best final 50 I've, I've ever had. And, and I attribute the grand majority of that to, um, you know, the, the guys up at University of Michigan and, and by extension, John Urbanchek, who I was training with leading up to those games. And I just remember the couple of years leading up to the games, I would try to do freestyle threshold sets and keep up with the freestylers, but backstroke. And um, I, I remember one of my best sets uh, was, was 200s backstroke. And I think I averaged for a set of, I think it was 10 200s backstroke. I averaged 203 or 204 meters. And I think that I was, I was holding, or I, my, my interval was like 230 or 235 or something like that. So I knew I was really, really fit. And knowing that, you know, I was swimming against guys like Ryan Lochte, who's an incredible, incredible backstroker and, and has uh, way more sprinting genes than I do. And um, a guy like Ryosuke Irie, who obviously has a ton of speed, you know, he was a player in the 100 backstroke. So I knew that if there was any way that I was going to have a chance at competing with those guys, it was, it was going to have to be in the second half. So that's, that's what I did. I just trained a ton of backstroke. And I remember the warm up that I had leading up to that swim. Um, you know, my, my warm ups were normally, you know, I would, I would do my warm up, I would do some starts do a couple pops of speed and then I would go do some pace and then I would get out. And this time I did, I think I did eight fifties pace, a couple more than John even wanted me to. And I remember I was hitting, I was going like 27, six to the feet feeling like I was blowing bubbles. And I was like, we're about to go really fast. And that kind of helped build up some confidence leading into the race. Uh, and I, I think, I guess to answer your question directly, a lot of it was just a ton of conditioning and that's really what I was able to hang my hat on. It did, so you're going 203, 204, 200 meter back repeats in practice, racing guys doing freestyle on, on a 230 interval. How this many, set in particular was actually by myself, believe it or not. Oh, interesting. Wow. So how many 200 backs would you go at 203, 204 long course meters? Uh, in that particular set, there were 10 of them. I, I think my last one was actually 202 something. And my, my first one started out at like 205, but it was like a 203 high average. You know, there's a lot of mid-distance people, folks who, who could really just crank it. And uh, they do phenomenal things in practice. And this is another case in point where you're, we're hearing something that is, it's like what happens in practice? Sometimes it's not more impressive than Olympic gold medals, but you know what? It kind of sounds like it. It's like so fast. Uh, is that something that is a, a common theme throughout your time from, from the moment when you really got on the international stage around 2007? Was that, was that, was this your life in the pool workout day after day? I, I think that I was just one of those people who was too stupid to enjoy losing in any way. Um, I, it didn't matter. And, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that every practice I was, I killed it all because that was probably more the rule than the exception, right? Like I was, um, I just always tried to win everything that I was, I was swimming and And that was obviously in, in meets, but in practice too. And, um, I really started improving once I went to, um, fast, which is the Fullerton aquatic sports team. And I was swimming with Kevin Perry and we were just doing tons and tons and tons of yardage. I mean, like an average set, uh, an average threshold set for us would be like 10 400s or like 10 600s or something like that. Just like tons and tons of yardage on, on a 110 base long course. So in high school, like I, I already had a really high level, I, in my opinion, um, of, of aerobic capacity. And then I went to Michigan and it was a lot of the same. Like, um, sure, I got, I got more exposure when I was at behaving properly to some of the more um, sprinty aspects of, of the sport. And that was fun, but it was still, you know, Michigan is known for being one of those, um, one of those blue collar teams. It's just all about work, you know, like, like Mike Murray says, work works. Right. And 
I trained a ton of 4IM. I did a ton of really hard sets there. And, and that is, again, ultimately what I think is why it translated into me being able to have a solid back half in most of my races and, and being able to swim five, six, seven, eight events at a particular meet, albeit I didn't do that at trials, but, or excuse me, at the Olympics, I did at trials and I did at a lot of, um, a lot of other big meets before that. Were you one of these guys who's like, you know what? I wish it was a 400 meter backstroke. That's, that's, I wish there was 800 IM. <laughs> better, better. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> you know what? An 800 IM would be a great event because it's uh, 400 IM is pain. All muscle groups, it's awful. I did it at YMCA Nationals and, uh, you know, and I was like, I don't want to do it. And I did it like probably the last time I was 15 years old. I'm like, not anymore. This is not for me. It's a, but 800 IM, that should be, you should be lobbying FINA for that. <laughs> I, I could simultaneously lobby FINA for it and become one of the most unpopular swimmers in, in, in swimming again, just by uh, urging that event be created. <laughs> did you ever do a 400 backstroke in a 400 free or did you ever do an 800 IM in an 800 free at a meet? No. Nope. Buddy. Never did that. You, you, you can't put it down on the podcast and be like, nope, never did it. <laughs> but, but honestly, like that's, that's a good point. But honestly, most of the time, whenever I had the opportunity to do something like that, like if it was – if it was a 400 free, my coach wanted me to go some solid 400 free and I, and I could swim in an okay 400 free and same thing for the 800. You know, if, if there was an 800 out there, he'd want me to go and, and swim that 800 to the best of my ability instead of, uh, you know, it, I think some of the, the time when I would have been most likely to do that would have probably been in high school. And my coach at the time was very like, these are the opportunities that you're going to get. And these are, and you're going to make the most of those opportunities. I, I didn't really get many opportunities to do things like that. Not in a bad way. In fact, I think it was very good that he had that mindset. Uh, when you were growing up, when, when, when did you know, okay, it's going to be 400 IM, 200 back. I mean, I was hoping you'd be like after, after your 2009 world, uh, at trial, at trial, world trials, you were a 153, 200 butterfly. So I was like, he's going to be a 200 butterfly now. Um, you popped some great swims. When did you know what your lineup was going to be? Or were you a young kid who like, you know, was going to, to uh, regionals or sectionals in the, in the mile? Um, I would definitely cl have classified myself as more of a distance swimmer early on. Like I, I swam the mile a lot. Um, and I swam the 4IM a lot. I didn't honestly, I didn't get really many opportunities to swim hundreds and fifties. So it's kind of always been that way. Um, and as far as the 400 IM goes, you know, it was just kind of something that came to me. It was never, I would never have considered, I would never consider myself someone who was so good in all four strokes that I could be good at the 400 IM. I just feel like I was able to deal with pain a little bit better than, than most people, if that makes sense. And 400 IM is, is, definitely one of those like if you ask any swimmer out there i think they would agree that the 400 im is the most painful event there is when did your backstroke turn on when did when did you go okay this is it uh, i'm i'm gonna you know what I, let me venture a guess you're someone who can't you are comfortable being uncomfortable you can't handle pain but god knows you know tom jager first first one of his first like he went to nationals in the mile and then ended up doing the 50 free there's something about it. you're doing distance, but anything short, shorter, it's kind of exciting. Um, did you, did this backstroke with 200 back? Was it like, it's short, it's my sprint. I'm doing this. I'm focusing here. It, uh, the, the 200 backstroke was, was always fun to me because it felt like probably the most strategic race that, that I had in, in my repertoire, so to speak, because I felt like I had enough, I had enough fitness and ability that I could, I could let a race pan out for the last half in many ways. And oftentimes the way I wanted, obviously it didn't always work out like that, but that's, that became more of the way I swam the 200 backstroke. I'd say starting my sophomore year at Michigan. Um, I remember hitting the hundred yard wall at Michigan and my, my sophomore year and just remember, you know, being able to see to either side of, of me, the, the guys I was swimming against. And I remember seriously saying to myself, see ya, because I knew like 
if you're even with me now, there's no way you're going to keep up with me on this last hundred. And that's kind of, that was when I was like, all right, I think the 200 backstroke is probably one of my better events on top of the 4 a.m. Um, and it's, it's funny that you mentioned the 200 butterfly because my mom <laughs> had actually been the one for a very long time who was pushing me to swim that event. I'll be the first person to admit, I hate that event. I really dislike it. And the fact that I swim it at the games, you know, was, uh, my mom still jabs, jabs me about that one to this day. But, uh, I remember in, in Michigan while I was there, I was at a swim meet in Montreal. I forget which meet it was, but my mom had been urging me over and over and over again, please swim the 200 butterfly. I love watching you swim the 200 butterfly. And I ended up going, like I, I dropped two or three seconds at that meet and it was completely out of the blue. So like, well, I guess I'm swimming the 200 butterfly as well now. And, that, and I did it for a couple more years and that was my, uh, one of my Olympic events, which was rather ironic. It was good. You had to, you had to kind of knock the dust off at the Olympics so that you'd be ready for your turn or backstroke. Let me ask you this as a pain specialist in swimming, 400 IM, 200 back, 200 fly. These are painful events. My, my theory is that the 200 back is more painful than the 200 fly because 200 fly is rhythmic and 200 back. There's no place to hide. It's all driving. Um, you're, you have one of the greatest 200 backstrokes of all time. Tell me about the pain compare in the 200 back compared to 200 fly for you. The, for me, the pain would manifest itself in the 200 butterfly more as like a, a dead, a deadening and a, and a heavy type of pain. Like it wasn't, it wasn't as bright, vibrant and intense pain as you might get with the, with the back, uh, 200 backstroke, but the 200 back, it's, a, <laughs> you're using all of your big muscle groups all the time and it's, there's no real respite from it. Even when you go underwater, it's kind of the same thing. But to your point with, with butterfly, you know, you get small um, micro recoveries during, during the the race. And um, especially on the walls, like, you know, even if you have fast walls, that's still a micro recovery too. And you don't really get it as much in the, in the backstroke, in my opinion. Um, But yeah, I'd say that the 200 fly was more of a, a heavy feeling as, as opposed to the tutor back being more sharp. I thought about it a lot and I think you just explained it better than I ever could in decades and decades and decades of thinking of this. Yeah. Well, get fly, you're getting lower in the water. So you start pushing water, but you do have all those. You, it is about leverage and, and it is rhythmic, but backstroke when I, I did a lot of 200 backstrokes, a lot of hundred backstrokes and it hurts. Once the pain comes on, it starts, to, it starts to hurt and it seems like it goes exponential very quickly. Where, where was your pain when you're popping a 28.4 or were you aware that you were reeling everybody in and you were on an emotional high when you're reeling locked in? Um, so I, I had no idea I was reeling anybody in. Um, I, I just remember saying to myself, like, this is it. If there's any time that you're going to push harder and farther than you ever have before, it might as well be the freaking Olympic Games, right? So um, I do remember that was probably one of the only times that I pushed myself hard enough to actually get tunnel vision. Um, and that was one of the reasons why earlier on when I was talking about, like, I could only see splashing off to my right. I, most of the time, like I wore Swedish goggles, like old school, plastic only, no cushion, <laughs> uh, but it had great peripheral vision. So in a normal, normal setting, I would be able to look out of my periphery and see whether or not the splashing was being caused by feet or arms. And I was, you know, I was sort of tunneling and all I could see was splashing. So I just... I remember gritting my teeth and I actually, I don't think you can see it on the video, but I remember reaching back and like letting out the biggest like yell that I could just like stretch and, and deal with it just for another half second or so. But, um, okay. We're going to, we're going to uh, want to work backwards from that 200 backstroke final. Honest question. As we're live, did, how's your relationship with Lochte? Were you, were you guys buddies? Did you hate him? Did, was he just you know, like, oh, you know, how, how would, how would you, in, in retirement, now looking back, how would you characterize that relationship? I would say, you know, we, uh, we were buddies. 
you know, we weren't, we weren't training partners or anything like that at that point. Obviously I got to train with them for several years leading up to the 2016 trials. And, um, you know, that was, that was a great experience because he's, he's a you know, very lovable person and um, he works really, really hard. And I think we had, you know, kind of a, at least this is my impression, you have to ask him what he thinks, but um, I feel like there was, there was a mutual respect because we both came from very, um, programs that were known for their, their volume and their intensity, him working with Troy and, and me working with bottom and, and Dr. Josh White and, um, and John Urbanchek. So I feel like, you know, we, we were always had a, a good relationship in that way. And it was, I remember, you know, joking around with him and dancing around and making a fool of myself in the ready room leading out to that race. So I you know, had and have a good relationship, I'd say. He is, you know, he's a lovable guy. I didn't, but I didn't know if there was this like, you know, you're going to say, Hey, there's one thing that just uh, drove me nuts. Like I, I couldn't, I hated it when he wore his grill all the time and it just made me want to beat him that much more. I didn't. Ryan's Ryan, man. But what, one thing that drove me nuts about him is that he has this, he's, he's so good that he can, he can get up and compete against a Michael Phelps and a hundred butterfly and then get up and go, lay down one of the fastest 400 IMs that, you know, that history's ever seen. And I couldn't do that. So I did always um, envy him for that. It's a, I, I noted earlier that, you, you know, you're competing in a time when it was, it was the most competitive in our swimming era and it was Lochte and it was Phelps. And, uh, you know, we, we I'm not going to title our, our talk this way, but it could be, you could title it as, the swimmer with the most character in swimming who has the most experience in the third place club <laughs> because you, you've That's got, fair. you've got third places, buddy. And you know, you spread them out really well, but by, by the way, I'm a third place club member also. And my, my last trials was a third place. And, uh, but it's, I was, I was, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd forgotten about that. Uh, let me see here. Third place, uh, two, uh, 2008, 200 back third place. Also fourth in the 400 I am, almost a third place club in the 400 I am in 2008. 2012, third in the 400 I am. Uh, and 16, third in the 200 backstroke, which is, you know, at trials, getting third, you're, you're putting down a fast swim. You're putting down a great swim. Sure. But and how, how do you square that now, years later? You still love the sport. You're working in the sport. You work with fitter and faster. But like, you know. Where does, what, where, how does this hold space in your brain? I, I mean, um, honestly, I, 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 when I look back at my career, I, I think the definition of my career is that amongst two of the swimmers that I think most people would agree and describe them as some of the greatest swimmers of all time, I swam in their events. I, you know, I, I pushed myself to, um, uh, you know, to, to swim against those guys. And, you know, the fact that I was able to beat them here and there, um, you know, I think that's definitely something to hang my hat on. Um, I, I wouldn't put myself on the same level as, as Ryan or as, as Michael, um, <laughs> for a litany of reasons. I don't think that's, uh, come, should come as a shock to anybody, but, um, I, I just remember there was a Mark Schubert and Jack Roach um, told me something once. And they said that there was a, there was a, a coaches meeting that they were having up at Colorado Springs at the Olympic training center. And they were, they were talking about me at one point and uh, they had, I guess they were in a conversation about some of the, the personalities that they appreciated in the sport. And they said that, you know, they described me like a wolf. They're like it, you know, he could be completely up against, something bigger, meaner, but it doesn't matter. He's going to, he's going to fight tooth and nail and, and, and make something of it and survive. And, um, that was kind of how I felt moving forward is like, I don't, I don't give a shit who these guys are. I want to beat them. Um, they bleed too. And honestly, it, it kind of gave me a little bit of power that sort of mental confidence to look at a lot of people that I was swimming against and watch them walk into the ready room and look over at Ryan and look over at Michael and, and I could see him, you know, give up immediately. And I just didn't view those guys that way. I knew that they were really great swimmers and it was going to take absolutely everything I had to maybe beat them, but I, I didn't view them as gods. Tyler Clary, the wolf in the ready room. 
I love it. I like I like that it I like that it came from the coaches at, at USA Swimming HQ where they're where they're talking. It it is it, you know here's the thing. It was clear that you didn't see see them that way. You're the, some of the greatest swimmers, and they are. They have the the most medals here. Michael Absolutely. has the most medals. Ryan has the second most medals among the men, and swim. And it was clear that you didn't see them that way. Uh, what is more satisfying, beating Ryan or beating Michael? <laughs> Uh, well, I'd say, I'd say the time that I beat Ryan was slightly more, uh, notorious than, uh, than the time that I beat Michael, but you know, anytime, anytime that you get the opportunity to swim against one of those guys. And if it works out for you, obviously it's huge. I think anybody, anybody would appreciate that, but it goes without saying that Ryan and Michael beat me a heck of a lot more times than I beat them. (laughs) I know it's uh, it, it, I, a lot of people think that you're, you're not aware of what your ability is, but we, you know, we spend so much time, we invest so much of ourselves in the sport and we see our competitors training camps in the, in sometimes our careers will fall over theirs at the same club, which you've experienced also with, with both of them. And, uh, but you know where you stand. So you knew where you were at. Did you, did you, when you, when you were training and you had those long, hard days, did you see yourself as an underdog? Did you fantasize in your head? Tyler's behind, but here's coming. He's, he's closing. How did um, you live in your, in your head space day in and day out? What motivated you to put it down and practice every day? Um, so as it relates to Michael, you know, he and I got to train together for a year at Michigan and I think, you know, even some of the recent stories that, um, that Michael has, has been a part of um, talking about certain parts of his, his career, I think he would agree that, you know, there, there were times when, you know, he, he maybe could have done things differently. And I think that you could say that about me too, um, any athlete for that matter. But I think the time that I was training with him, I remember there were more often than not, the longer sets I would be able to beat him. But if it was anything that was, that was fast, um, he would, he would beat me. And I just always remember thinking to myself while I was in the middle of those big sets, like if there's any time where you're putting in the work to be able to place yourself in an opportunistic zone to beat someone like that, it's right now. So I remember going into some of the times where I was swimming against him and remembering all of the hard work that had been put in. And that was kind of something just like, all right, well, if there's any time where this is going to show through, it's now. And I think I've always known that I've had the ability to deal with pain um, pretty well. So I thought, all right, well, if I've, if I put in the long distance work, I've got the fitness and I can deal with the pain. Maybe this is the time that it's going to happen. So I never really viewed myself as, as an underdog, so to speak. It was always kind of like I felt like I had a chip on my shoulder. It seemed like that. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> uh, you just, um, there's, certain, okay, there's certain things just hanging out in the, in the mix zone, the media zone, when you're, when you're on deck or at the big meets. One thing is that out of respect, you're staying out of athlete's way. And you're trying to stay out of their headspace because you know they've got to do what they've got to do. But you but we're watching you. And so I would watch, you know, Ryan seemed pretty happy go lucky. Michael sometimes seemed like he was just, you know, he seemed like he wanted to kill someone. It was like and, livid. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, but you had a, you were very focused and, uh, I, that vibe came off of you. I got that scent like, yeah, this guy, I, I, if I had to put it in words, I couldn't do it as well. But like the wolf in the ready room. Yeah. You seem like a wolf in the ready room. And, uh, and that's another way of saying chip on your shoulder. So it, yeah, it was very real and it was, uh, which made the, which made the 2012 Olympic win in that final 50 that much more satisfying because it, it's, it was, uh, it felt like it was a slow burn and it felt like you were earning your stripes and it felt like a slow burn. And then finally, this is the crowning achievement. Um, in terms of the, uh, in terms of your takeaway, you know, you need great athletes to, and you, I'm, I'm sure you feel honored that, Hey, I, I shared history and error with these guys. Yeah. But, uh, when you're, when you're talking to kids, um, you know, how do you describe what you describe to me? Cause you, you work at fitter and faster and it's the largest company in on the planet, uh, hosting camps and clinics. And really it's a massive educational platform. You know, how do you translate what you experienced? to age group kids? 
Um, the analogy or maybe the metaphor that I use, or I think that the, the mindset that I try to get across to some of the younger kids um, is, is difficult to put into words, I think is, is what you're saying. And I, I'd use guys like Michael or Matt Grievers to demonstrate what I thought um, the, that the, that was the heart of that mindset. So most time, most of the time I would swim against a guy like Matt Grievers, who's six foot nine, right? He's, he could literally set his elbow on the top of my head. And I used to have to swim against that guy. And most, most swimmers that I'd watch, and I, I honestly, I would love, I'm, I love reading people's body language. And I would love to get into the ready room just a little bit early and watch people come in and, and watch how they reacted as, as they saw certain people in the ready room. And a lot of times you would see, especially with the younger swimmers, you would see them walk in and, and look at gargantuan grievers. And immediately you could tell that the, the competitive competitiveness was gone. They're like, oh yeah, there's no way I'm going to be able to beat go-go gadget arms into the wall. And I just thought that was ridiculous because if you think about it, if we're all in the final of the 200 backstroke, let's, or, or any event for that matter, you could argue that we've all gone roughly the same time. And if Matt Grievers and I have gone roughly the same time and he's nine inches taller, that means I'm the better swimmer before we've even set a foot in the water. But most people don't think that way. So what I boiled it down to is it, it's just this mindset of why not me um, instead of why me? Most people think why me instead of the other way. And I find people who are really, really accomplished athletes who've made it to the very top and have competed against some of the greatest of all time, whether or not they win, have the ability to think in that way. So um, that's, I don't know if that answers your question directly, but that's, that's sort of what I boil it down to. Uh, dude, I love talking to you because it, it, you, you give me deeper insight into things that I've experienced and seen and, and witnessed with other athletes over the generations, but it, it, it is the ready room. The race starts in the ready room oh, yeah. and it starts there. And, and you see if it's, a lot of things play out, but I'm hearing it from you now, but it really is. It's like certain energy levels start to build up in the ready room. And those are athletes who are, they're the wolves <laughs> and certain energy levels start to get drained. And uh, I'm glad that you that you are one of the wolves. Uh, there, there's a few things. I want to, we're, we're winding down on time. We've got about six minutes left. And you have, uh, I want to talk to you about the name change. I want to talk to you about some personal things that you really enjoy. But just, you know, it's a, I haven't heard the story told in a long time. But, you know, your Tyler Clary was not how we came to know you. We came to know you as Scott Flowers. But you changed it. Why did you change it? So, um, yeah, so I was born Scott Tyler Clary. Tyler is my middle name, so Tyler didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, uh, the first, so there's a story about the first name and a story about the last name. So, uh, and I think it's important to talk about the last name first. So I was, again, I was born Scott Tyler Flowers, and um, my mother and father uh, separated when I was very young. And... Um, I forget exactly how old I was. I was pretty young and my mom met you know, who I call my dad, my stepdad. I've called him dad ever since I can remember. Um, and I've lived with him. He's taken me to practices and flown around the world. And um, when I turned 18, and in fact, before I had turned 18, I had, I had tried to change my name because I felt, I felt that it was important that, um, you know, I was a part of the Clary family because it, because that, it, as far as I was aware, I, I, I was, um, it wasn't anything against the flowers family. I still, you know, I still have contact with them and, and we still talk regularly, regularly, but I, I was a Clary and that was just important to me because, you know, he, he was my dad and, you know, my father, um, struggled with drugs for most of his life. He was in, in prison for a very long time. Um, unfortunately he, he passed away, uh, last year. And, um, that was just kind of the story of, of my last name. And, you know, not many didn't really talk about it. You know, I've, I've made more peace with it over the last 18 months for sure. Um, but that's just, you know, that was that, that story. And my first name was kind of a, a slightly funnier story. So, my mom wanted me to be named Tyler 
and my father wanted me to be named after him, which is Scott. And um, they had a, they had a disagreement. So at, when I was born, um, my father was the one who filled out the the paperwork. So instead of being Tyler Scott Flowers, it became <laughs> Scott Tyler Flowers. It, my mom has just called me by the name that she's wanted, which was Tyler, ever since I can remember. So when I was 18 and I, I had the the legal ability to do so without parental consent, my, my name became Scott Tyler Clary, but everybody has still known me as, as Tyler Clary. It's uh, every time I hear it, and I've heard it a few times over the years, I get a few more details and it, and it sounds, it sounds like there's a lot going on, but it, what a wonderful way to honor the guy who raised you. And now Clary is a gold medalist. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That, that is, that is, that is the ultimate honor. That's a wonderful thing. I appreciate you sharing it. The, and, and, uh, you know, I should ask you ahead of time, are you, are you feeding your, your NASCAR, your, your, your car racing fix? You know, what's happening in your life there? Um, so I, I haven't been in a car in a while, uh, but I, I do still get some phone calls from people who I've, I've raced with. Um, not, not anything super, super high level, uh, mostly regional stuff, but, uh, you know, I've made some friends over the years and, um, they still want me to come out and race and, I've just been, uh, I've been super busy with work and, um, my wife isn't all that thrilled <laughs> with the, the prospect of me going fast in a race car. But, um, uh, I think in the next couple of years, uh, and we've talked about this in the next couple of years, I do want to be getting back into some more cars and it'll probably be more sports cars, um, and not, not, uh, oval track cars. So nothing NASCAR necessarily, unless I get that opportunity. But, um, I do, I do really enjoy that. And it's, so for, for a long time, the reason why I enjoy racing for a long time, my hardware was, was this, right? It was, it was my body and I felt like I got pretty good at, at using my hardware. But what's fun for me is that being in a race car, you have to, your, your hardware becomes the car. Like it's, it's kind of an out of body experience in, in learning what the car is doing and what certain feels mean and even what smells mean. I mean, in the middle of a race, a certain smell can tell you something is going on or about to happen with the car and you can adjust accordingly. So it's very much an out of body experience and it's becoming an athlete in the car and, and abstractifying the, the car as yourself versus just your body. Does that make sense? Sounds like I just, I just your passion. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's, it's, it sounds like you're really passionate about it. Can we do we have time for one more question or did you have to bump? No, we're good, man. We're, okay, we're, here we're you go. One, here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the question. That, uh, everybody has that, that one race that really hurt. So we, we, know, we, we you know, I wanted to talk to you because that, 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 200, that 200 backstroke was, was extraordinary. It's the last 50. Everyone has to go watch it. I'll go try and get a link to it and put it in this pod when we, put it, when we post this on Swim Swam. But the, everyone has that one race that, that was a great race, but it hurt. And you didn't do what you wanted to do. 200 back Olympic gold. You were just trying to get on the podium. You won gold medal. Where did you put it down in the pool? And you were like, damn it. That hurt. And that was a disappointment, even though I performed. Well, what race was that for you? Um, I don't know that it's going to match up to all your criteria identically, but the, the race that comes to mind, um, was the same year. And in fact, like six or seven weeks before the big race. And that was the 400 I am. Um, I got third in the 400 IM in 2012 and that was the race that I was gearing up for. And, and even though, you know, Phelps kind of surprised everybody and, and swam that race because nobody, nobody was really expecting him to swim that race because he hadn't very many times the whole year leading up. And, um, I was, I was relishing that there was going to be an opportunity for me, him and Michael to throw down. And, and we did. And the two of them got the best of me. But the, the reason why that one sticks out to me and still to this day makes me angry is because I believe that race was on a, it was either on a sat, Sunday or a Monday. And I remember two days before we were already in Omaha and I came down with a fever. I felt like, absolute trash and i just remember getting through the prelim and thinking like i don't know how i can go any faster and just kind of starting to understand like okay like this is going to take something superhuman or it's just not going to work out and 
I remember getting through um, the first 200, and, and I believe I was leading at the 200 over those two guys. And and I remember hitting the 50 wall in the in the breaststroke and just thinking like it's it's over. I have nothing left. And I actually, I actually, um, you know, got third. And, and after the race was over, like that that took. I went to another level mentally, even to get the third, in my opinion. And it hurt so much because I knew that if I was healthy leading up to that race, that I would have been able to perform differently. Does that mean that I, the results would have been different? I don't know. But I, I think that my performance would have been very different. And it bothered me so much so that, um, and John could see this, it bothered me so much so that he said, all right, we're scratching your events for tomorrow. And I want you to get away from the pool. And, and I, I don't want you to be anywhere near a pool. And I actually went with my, uh, with my girlfriend at the time. And I spent the entire day at a go-kart racing facility, just getting my frustration out on a track that, you know, something that I, I could do. And, and that really kind of reset my, um, my mental level. And I was able to come back after that rest and, and have a new mindset and then was able to make it happen in, in two other events. So that 400 I am is definitely one that really, really bothered me. Uh, 400 I am cracks the seal at Olympic trials and it does it in a big way performing at that level. And then having, knowing there's going to be seven more days. Uh, so it sounds, it sounds like her really, really knew what he was doing, but we, I mean, I think you explained it, but it's when you have that much time and you have to keep your energy levels in the right place. Uh, you did it twice. You know, you, you, you were a third, you were third place and fourth place at 08, 200 back fourth and then 400 I am. So you, you, you knew disappointment, but it was, uh, what, what did you do besides go, go ride go-karts buddy? Cause you, you had to, you had to bounce back. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, the go-kart racing and, and, you know, I slept in the day, the day after, and, um, I got a massage and, and just did everything. I, I hydrated like crazy. Like I knew it wasn't just, you know, get out and go have fun. Like it was, it was go reset yourself. And thankfully, you know, the, the heaviest part of the fever was on Sunday, the day before, I believe it was a Monday race. It, it was, it was on Sunday. And I think it got up to like one Oh two or one Oh three. It was relatively high. And the next day, you know, the, the fever wasn't as much there. I think I was still like in the hundred range or so, but it wasn't as bad. So the, the following day, you know, I was back in the, into a normal zone and I felt like I could recover. So it was all about eat, eat as much as you can, drink as, as much fluids as you can and, and rest as much and we'll see where it goes. And I think, um, I forget which events I did on the, the third and fourth days, but I think af every day after that 400 IM, I, I was feeling healthier and healthier. So you knew going into the Olympics after 12, 2012 trials, you knew you had better races. You had a, you had a better 200 back. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I had all, and not only a site, honestly, I hadn't even thought about that. Um, I just always, I had, had looked back at the opportunities where I had to swim a trials and then turn around within a relatively short period of time and swim at a high level again, like the world championship trials in 2009 to world championships in, in Rome. I had a, had a good history of being able to go faster at the big competition when it mattered than, than before. So I, I felt confident that at the Olympics, I was going to swim faster just as a factor. That's how I operated. I, honestly, I didn't even think about that. That's a good point. You keep your gold medal. Huh? Where do you keep your gold medal? It's right there. Oh, I can just see it. I can just see it. <laughs> um, well, you know, a lot of folks keep it in their sock drawer. So kudos to you, buddy, for, for putting it out there. And, and, and that's nice. I like that. Well, it's, it's my wife's doing, actually. She, uh, I normally, I actually, uh, I could, honey, can you get my metal box? I'm not sure if you're if you're out there listening, and if this is a download for you guys, and you're not you're not watching the video, Tyler just asked uh, his wife to bring the box. Are you going to show us the box? Well, it's so normally it would sit in this box, which was given to me in London, and it looks like crap because <laughs> it's seen 
it's seen all sorts of travel. I don't, I have no idea if she even heard me, but um, it usually sat in my nightstand under a bunch of stuff. And, and one day she, um, I think it was for Christmas or my birthday, she had uh, somebody make a special shadow case for it. Cause she, she's, I actually think she's, she's more proud of, of it in that than I am. I, I think it's like a cool trinket or whatever, but I, it is, it does look kind of cool up there in its own little shadow box. Do you, I appreciate do you like, her for do, doing that. So when, when it's like, you know, years later, have you had that moment? I'm not saying I've done this, but have you had this moment years and years later where you're alone in the house, you just got out of the shower, you're naked, put the metal on, just wear it around. <laughs> I'm just, no. you, know, you can, you know, nobody's listening. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I've never, never done that. I would actually, I would rather. So at, at um, to give you a little insight into how I view it um, at fitter and faster events before the pandemic, mind you, um, there's usually an opportunity for people to take pictures with the clinicians. And one of the things that I like to do is make sure that every athlete that I take a picture with is at least given the opportunity or um, know that they can, if they want to put it around their neck. Because for me, I almost feel like the, the guy who carries the Stanley cup around, like he's, he's a steward of, of something really cool. It doesn't define that person. He's more like a steward. And as far as I'm aware, or as far as I'm concerned, that thing belongs to the U.S. more so than it does me. I'm just the one who gets to keep it at night, right? And um, I would be much more comfortable with somebody else wearing it and being able to draw some inspiration from that and watch their, you know, the just the the belief do different things and the inspiration do different things to them. Cause I think that's a, that's a cooler experience that I get to have because of that. And, and that's more of how I feel about it as opposed to it being like, here, this is me. Look at me, you know, cutting it there. Hang on one second. So I'm going to cut off the Coleman, cut it there with the emotional thing about the, the metal. That was fantastic. That's I was looking for a big close. Thank you. We'll have to bring you back and talk more about your career, some other topic or anything you want to talk about really. Sure. But, uh, I'm happy to chat. Yeah, I know you're a pro. I, I, I like doing this, and, uh, and I appreciate you sharing with me about the Tone Reader Backstroke, man. I, I, I screwed up. I kept trying to find, has anyone closed like that ever? What do you mean? Like, I don't know. I was trying In to the find, back? I was trying to find Pierce Hall's last 50 in the Tone Backstroke at uh, 2009 uh, World. Yeah, if there, was any, if there was anywhere, that would probably be one of the – best i remember watching that race and being absolutely floored watching that race like <laughs> it was clear and, and honestly the, the icing on the cake of that london experience was aaron being there and and i remember going up to do the nbc post race or post medal ceremony bs and um he was standing there while while we were waiting this was before i had even seen my parents and he came over and you know Aaron's one of my idols, man. Like have, having him there was cool. And, and I remember him walking up to me, he says, it may not even occur to you years from now, how unbelievable it is what you just did. And that was, that was really, really cool. And, and that was the same type of feeling that I had watching him in 2009. Like that was unbelievable to me. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.